So, welcome to Times Square, <laughs> uh, where in the shadow of Times Square, there's a number of shelters, a number of individuals uh, without names, uh, the faceless and the nameless, the homeless. And so I've come here today, one, to welcome you to New York City, um, which is the greatest city in the world, and also uh, to let you know a little bit about the Office of Public Advocate. You see, you know, I'm the only public advocate in the city, of, in the entire nation, which is elected to office. I am second to the mayor of the city of New York. Some say I wake up every day, I call the mayor. When he answers the phone, I hang up because my job is done. I don't have to, to take over the position of mayor. <laughs> the mayor and I served um, in the city council together. Uh, the mayor was the public advocate before he became the mayor of the city of New York, and the mayor happens to be a, an ally of mine from time to time, but I also have the honor and the privilege of suing the mayor from time to time when I disagree with him. <laughs> And he reminds me of that. My office uh, provides critical oversight of city agencies, and we investigate issues on behalf of everyday New Yorkers. And since I took office, we've handled over 17,000 constituent complaints in two years. And often, these New Yorkers have exhausted every other resource, and they frequently face income or language barriers, and they don't know where else to turn for help. Some individuals refer to my office as the office of last resort. And these issues range from a family in Brooklyn who has no heat in their apartment to a mother in Brooklyn who is unable to get their child with special needs the support at school that they need. And we use a variety of tools to fight against discrimination and injustice for those without resources to make their voices heard in government. We introduce uh, legislation. As I mentioned, we have the ability to introduce, uh, to file litigation. And what I love most about my job uh, as a former city council member and my fame, uh, the reason why so many people often associate me with being um, uh, someone with a loud voice is that I just really love to agitate people. So we call it um, litigation, legislation, and agitation um, in our fight against discrimination and injustice for those without the resources to make their voices heard in government. And oftentimes, uh, we see the homeless. And during my, the inauguration speech two years ago, when I brought Dasani to the platform, I was criticized. I was criticized by every major media outlet in the city of New York. And they said um, I was doing nothing but embarrassing the former mayor, Mayor Bloomberg. Uh, but the reality is, is that I really wanted to bring, uh, put a face on homelessness, particularly child homelessness. And I wanted to humanize Dasani and make her more than a story in the New York Times. And let her know that she was a child with brothers and sisters. And Dasani yelled at me because she said, you should have told me you were, you were bringing me up to the podium. And I said, why? She said, because I needed to brush my hair. <laughs> and I said, oh, it, it looks lovely. And Dasani's doing well. Um, she's in school, private school. Uh, but unfortunately, there are too many children in our homeless shelters, too many in children in our homeless system. Homeless children are the most vulnerable New Yorkers. They're voiceless and they're invisible. And oftentimes, too many New Yorkers turn away from the homeless when they see them on our streets. In fact, there are 77,000 homeless students in our public school system in New York City. 77,000. And some of these children are in shelters, and some are sleeping on couches, and are at friends' houses or in relatives' apartments. They're couch surfing. And the impact of having an unstable home environment is traumatic on children, has a lifelong impact. And we see the, we see the homeless individuals on our streets, especially here in New York City and big cities around the world, every day. But there are also homeless people we don't see. The impact of a child who does not know where she will sleep at night, or that she has only a place to live for the next week, or that day, or that evening, is life changing. And oftentimes, I see homeless in the city and in my beloved Brooklyn 
I see them wearing, just carrying these plastic bags with all of their worldly possessions as they shuffle from place to place to place to place. I see them in my former beloved district, which has changed dramatically as a result of gentrification. And they represent the displaced residents all throughout the city of New York as a result of um, escalating rents in our city. And many homeless now live in really poor neighborhoods with little resources. And more often than not, they are witnesses or survivors of domestic violence. They face inadequate health care, and they have faced periods of hunger. And we have found that most of these children in New York and often large cities come from immigrant families, many for whom English is not their first language. And this means advocating for their children and their educational needs. It makes it even more difficult. And we need to do a better job understanding the gaps in services and systematic changes to address various issues that confront our homeless students and their families. And we cannot ignore the mental needs of these children. One quarter of homeless children in the United States need mental health services, which is far more than children with homes. And these children have been exposed to the evils of the world and their innocence torn away from them far too early. It is no surprising that these children suffer from mental health issues ranging from depression and anxiety uh, to being twice as likely to have a learning disability and being four times as likely to show delayed development. And our homeless children are at a higher risk for physical health issues as well, respiratory infections and ear infections and asthma. And they are more likely to have nutritional deficiencies and digestive issues. And how can we expect that these children, how can we expect them to come to school and concentrate every day when their focus is really about the, where they're going to sleep that night? And so, in, in fact, 20% of homeless children in New York drop out of school. And in some areas, as, as few as 34% of homeless students actually graduate, 34% in some parts of New York City. Homeless children are also form, far more likely to experience or witness acts of violence at a young age. Tomorrow I am uh, attending an event at a high school in Brownsville, and I'm sure all of you know or have heard about it. A number of us came out in the aftermath of a terrible crime where five young men allegedly raped a young girl in a, school, in a park, a park that she had entered with her father. And these five young men allegedly took a gun to the head of the father and told him to leave, and then they raped their daughter. And so tomorrow, uh, I'm holding a meeting with over 300 young men of color in high school. And a number of these young men are homeless to talk about the crime of rape and to talk about sexual violence. So you see, that's what public advocates do. We take on the difficult issues. But a number of these young boys are just immune to violence. And a number of them I've seen in our shelters all throughout the city of New York. And many times these violent acts are occurring within their own families. Children who witness this type of behavior from an early age are far more, far more likely to exhibit aggression, anxiety, depression, and violence in their childhood and later on in their lives. Children are our most precious resource, resource, and these are the most formative years of their lives. So we need to do more to ensure that they have a stable home, food to eat, and have the energy to come to school every day and learn. And we know that education is really the key to ending poverty, and I know that education really is the key to overcome all isms. As I often say each and every day, when you open a schoolhouse door every day, you close a prison door. And what we really need to do is focus and provide more resources to public schools as well as to building permanent affordable housing. But we need to make sure that our teachers and our principals and school counselors are trained to deal with the special needs of homeless children because so much time is spent addressing the non-academic needs of these students such as homeless children who are shuttled from shelter to shelter or couch to couch and forced to transfer schools during the year often more than 
once. And the hunger, the lack of clothing, the lack of school supplies, and emotional, physical trauma that so many of our homeless children face. You have no idea how important it is for a child to be dressed appropriately with the, the latest styles. And so many of our homeless children, unfortunately, just don't have the clothes to compete. Right now, my office is looking into these very issues and the best ways to address them and protect our children. And we need to make sure that these children are getting what they need to succeed. And as most of you know, we focused in the Office of Public Advocate on providing children school lunch. And in this city, there, are, there were once two separate lines for students getting lunch, one for students who can afford lunch and another line for those who could not, the haves and the have-nots. And we were successful in getting this administration to remove the stigma of poverty so that there's only one line and so that there's no difference between the haves and the have-nots. Children should not feel stigmatized at school because they have to stand in one line over another. They are there to learn and not feel the shame. And we need to make them all feel equal, equal. And I'm so glad that this administration and the chancellor of the city of New York, Carmen Farina, agreed. And I'm so glad to have led the fight, the effort for free lunches in New York City so no child has to feel this way. And it is working. And we need to pay attention to the high suspension rates of homeless students. Overall expulsion and suspension rates amongst poor students are twice as likely as their peers. And when homeless students are suspended, where do they go? We need to make sure we are tracking absences and, and that students aren't losing track of homeless students. And we cannot forget that students in shelters like counselors and social workers to help them navigate difficult situations in their personal lives and with their families and at school. We need to make sure that these students have the resources to do their homework because too often they do not have access to computers or wireless internet. And we need to have an education coordinator at each shelter so that they could help them with their homework and with their learning experience. We basically need more resources for our most vulnerable, our defenseless, and our innocent children. And I'm so happy that yesterday as I joined the governor of the state of New York that he's providing more additional resources and I look forward to joining with the mayor of the city of New York as he announces his budget to provide more resources for the homeless children. As a society, this must be our top priority. As the great Nelson Mandela said, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul in the way in which it treats its children. As we celebrate Dr. King's birthday this Monday, let us all remember those who were ignored, the less vulnerable, those who are locked out of the sunshine of opportunity. And let us join together and let us treat our children and our most vulnerable children with respect and decency. That is what Dr. King would have wanted. And let us give them every resource they need and ensure that every child in this city, this state, your state, my state, this country, and this world has a place to call home. And may we never ever see a, a child walk around in our streets with a plastic bag with all their worldly possessions. We can do better than that. I thank all of you because all of you, each and every day, do the work of the angels. You too are the invisible. And I wanted to say on behalf of the city of New York, on behalf of all of those who care, thank you and good morning.